welcome um, all of you from around the world. Uh, we are really happy to host uh, this next episode of uh, AW Agora with um, somebody who I'm very fond of uh, and I really respect her uh, work, an erudite professional who has built beautiful projects around the world. We are trying to facilitate thought leadership in all of you who are attending through conversations with uh, erudite professionals like Martha Schwartz. When she suggested the topic, for me, it was a slam dunk. For me, it was like, yep, that's what we're doing because it's really pertinent, it's really relevant. I'm really happy to host her. Without further ado, I like to start the conversation with Martha. Uh, what got you interested in geo, uh, you know, geoengineering? Because I mean, most of us know your reputation internationally for doing really thoughtful landscape architecture projects, and you seem to have pivoted, you know, in your leadership position as a landscape architect to doing something that. I would love to know the reason. Thank you so much for the intro. Uh, I'm really so thankful that you've agreed to let me talk about this because it's such a foreign, weird word, even geoengineering. And um, I can say that uh, I've been a real outsider for a number of years uh, because nobody knows what the hell I'm doing. The Arctic Ocean is warmed up, it's warming, and the permafrost, which we've all known as being kind of frozen, is melting, which is starting to actually put up a lot of methane. And when you know about methane, methane is like almost 30 times more potent as a greenhouse gas effect as, uh, as carbon dioxide. Our globe will heat up tremendously more quickly than we even thought. I freaked out. I thought, whatever I am doing, this, it just doesn't, it has no relevance. I'm a problem solver. You know, I, I've had my uh, practice for a long time. I'm used to having people coming and telling me problems, but my question is, don't come in and tell me a problem unless you have an idea for a solution. And these geoengineering solutions are the big scale ideas that really can affect different Earth systems that actually interact. We're talking about the atmosphere, the cryosphere, the oceans, the subduction, the biosphere. I mean, there are all these interactive systems are affected that actually we have affected and we are now driving. Anyway, I became really interested because they proposed some solutions or ideas. Mm. And I thought, this, this is cool. These guys are really thinking. These scientists are really working at it. They have been working at it. The scientists have known about this for decades. Uh, geoengineering is a group of, of different uh, ideas, and it's defined. I mean, you can see here, this is uh, the panoply of different geoengineering ideas. Mm -hmm. Some of them are natural ideas. When done at a big scale, it'll make a big difference, like planting a trillion trees. Uh, some are mechanical, some are chemical, and um, th the scientists are working on all of these ideas, which is what makes it so exciting. Hmm. But it's it's um, defined as a deliberate large-scale manipulation of an environmental process that affects the Earth's climate. And the attempt, what they're trying to do is to counteract the effects of global warming. And it has two major arms. One arm is about carbon dioxide removal or CDR. The other one is solar radiation management, which is SRM. Trying to figure out how to make the earth more reflective, how to get the, um, the radiation that comes in and heats up our earth back out into outer space. These ideas of brightening up cirrus clouds, stratospheric aerosol injection, putting particles up in the stratosphere to increase the reflectivity and thereby cooling the earth. Uh, that, that's that's my, my hope. This technique has received really the most sustained attention. It's very, very controversial, except that it has really, uh, it has impressive results. 
and to, we can actually offset the warming caused by a doubling of carbon dioxide. Uh, I would say that sulfates are what has been chosen as a, the aerosol, which is highly reflective. When volcanoes go off, it is a known fact that it cools down the earth. What, what they found out is that it's not the ash, it's the sulfur, the sulfates inside these clouds that stay up into the atmosphere and reflect light because sulfur is very highly reflective material. The idea is that the delivery of these aerosols could be achieved by using aircraft designed to fly high into the stratosphere. It's up high where it's more regular. Uh, they stay up in the atmosphere about a year. So it has to be continuously redone. Once we start to cool down the earth, there have to be a fleet of planes that go up there and disperse more of these aerosols until we can figure out how to bring down our emissions and be able to create a more balanced uh, climate. Who is going to pay for it? Nobody's going to pay for anything if they can't make a dime, if they can't make a profit. Who's going to pay for that? This is not a solution. It's a band-aid. It's not a solution. Yeah. It's a band-aid. This doesn't solve anything. It just is covering our ass mm -hmm. to try to get us to the other side. This is a very unloved idea, and it, I can understand why. It's not lovable. Putting more stuff, more pollution up into the atmosphere, that's a big argument. However, we put a lot of pollution up that is bad for us. Yeah, so this really just gives us time to transition to a carbon-based economy. We are now into an economy that is going to be based on decarbonization and how we can really calibrate our relationship to, to nature, which we imagine that we could control. We could conquer it. We did conquer it and integrate natural systems into our cities. And we have to build natural systems from any ideas that we have, from technology, from bio and bioengineering, any good ideas we have to actually resurrect environmental and ecological benefits and services to us so we can survive. 